I'm going to use that now as a segue for our last panel, which is from emerging scholars who will be in this world of, of LC research, who, who will be seeking funding and developing new questions for investigation. And um, we're really enthusiastic to hear what you guys have to say. So let me, I'm going to introduce all three of you now at once. Uh, Matt Lebowitz is an assistant professor of medical psychology uh, in the Department of Psychiatry here at Columbia. And he is really a specialist in studying how people reason about and react to genetic information uh, and other biomedical explanations for disorders and particularly psychiatric disorders and human behavior. Alexis Walker is an assistant professor in the Division of Ethics in the uh, Columbia's Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics. Um, she has a background in science and technology studies and has been studying how corporations function, if that's a good paraphrasing of your CV, Alexis. And Larry Aw is a candidate in sociology for doctorate in sociology from Columbia. And uh, soon he will be uh, assuming a position as assistant professor of sociology at the City College of New York in the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership uh, in the fall of 2022. So very, very good to have all of you here. All right, so I think I will start us off. Um, let me uh, share my screen here, sorry. One second, sorry about that, move this things around. Just doing a portion, so that was why. Oh, hopefully. Okay, I should have been doing this while we were doing the introductions, but here we <laughs> bear with me. And like we thought you were the tech savvy um, up and coming generation. Thank you guys very much for, for bearing with me. And thank you so much to the, the organizers. Really, it's been such a, such a wonderful uh, conference. I think really thoughtful uh, insights and really thoughtful organizations. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's also been really a pleasure to interact with the Columbia SEER over the years. Um, uh, I was a po postdoc at the Hopkins SEER, which focuses on ethical, legal, and social issues in genetics and infectious disease specifically. Um, and as many of you know, um, the SEERS have an annual conference each year that brings folks from all of the SEERS together. Um, and back in the days when we got together in person a little more often, I was able to get to know folks from the Columbia SEER that way. So Ruth and Paul and Maya and postdocs like Anna. Uh, Matt was a bit before my time. Um, Anna Jabliner I was mentioning. Um, and those interactions were really quite an essential part of my um, integration into the worlds, both of bioethics and, and LC. So I did my PhD in science and technology studies, um, and my dissertation chair was uh, Steve Hillgartner, who um, Eric Hunkst was reminding me was one of the first awardees of the LC program. Um, and he then went on to uh, write a book about the history of the Human Genome Project, et cetera, very much focused on genomics. But my dissertation did not focus on genomics. Um, I looked at how international financial institutions like the World Bank, which are some of the world's largest financiers of global health programs, um, how those institutions make decisions about the loans that they're gonna make for health programs. So, 
I've been interested in the financial aspects of health and medicine for quite some time, and I've brought that focus um, into my LC work. So I have a K99 ROO right now. I'm now in the ROO phase where I am, I'm studying profit motives and other LC issues uh, in private sector genomics, um, especially startup companies. So um, was very interesting to hear the discussions uh, in the last panel and lo looking forward to, to further conversation with all of you. Um, so I, I say all this as a way to ground my comments on the future um, of LC, which I'm gonna focus on both some structural issues in terms of uh, institutional organization and processes of the field of, um, of or if we can call it a field of, of LC, um, and also some some more on the of the sort of meat of the subject matter content of LC work. So um, on on the structural side, I wanted to talk a little bit about structures of interdisciplinarity. So um, I, I I've been really happy to see in the LC world a really strong interest. Um, in bringing more expertise from the critical social sciences and humanities um, into that world. Um, the, uh, I'd include in that science and technology studies, STS, um, medical cultural and medical anthropology, social uh, uh, sort of interpretive sociology, history, literature. We see a lot more um, folks uh, reaching out to those disciplines. Um, and I do think that we're able to bring analytical tools and sensitivities and frameworks um, on you know, the nuances of power and the fine grained relationships of sort of day-to-day -day, um, uh, real life interactions that are really significant for, for this, this domain to be thinking about how we reframe um, some of those categories that we've used. But the structures of interdisciplinary work are still a real challenge. So um, last week, my um, Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics at, at Columbia um, was able to meet with the new Dean of the Medical School, which is a really wonderful meeting. Um, but in that, you know, we had this conversation about the challenges of tenure and promotion in the context of interdisciplinarity when it's hard to evaluate um, people when they're publishing in lots of different kinds of journals, they're publishing in bioethics journals and they're publishing in geno genomics journals and they're publishing potentially in medical anthropology journals, et cetera. And how do we you know, read all of those things? And that's just not a problem that's unique to ELSI, but I do think that ELSI has long led the way in um, the um, sort of social st studies of medicine of structures and how we can move forward in our and the way that we organize our our um, our work so you know I think that one thing that came up right with the dean was um, how are we measuring what are the metrics for inter for measuring interdisciplinary work and I think that that's something that um, is really crucial that as we move forward, um, we think about in the LC world, what is it, we, it's great that we are super interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary but how do we support scholars um, in, in that work, um, both through training and also through, through, um, through the processes by which we evaluate people. So, um, you know, I do think really valuing the humanities um, doesn't fit sometimes very well with our grant, very grant funded world in the LC. So, you know, um, there are broader shifts in academia that I think we need to be considering um, when we think about the future of LC, right? So we have the shift towards non tenure track uh, uh, adjunct lecturing and also grant funding less and less hard money, money lines. What does that mean for how we integrate humanities into LC? Um, and also here on the, um, uh, you might be <laughs> curious about why this, this, this figure is here, which is the increasing role of um, uh, corporate funding of R&D in the United States vis-a-vis -vis the uh, federal funding, right? The, over the last 20 years or so, the decrease in percentage of that research funding that's coming from the national government and, and the increase that in the proportion that's coming in the US context from corporate sources. And so, I think it's something certainly that we need to be, I, I think we need to be as scholars fighting against uh, uh, decreases in federal funding for research. And of course, this is aggregate numbers, not by um, uh, subject area. I think we also need to think really seriously about what it means that we have this increase in private sector funding. How are we as LC scholars going to continue to, or going to interface with the corporate entities that we, and the commercial energy entities that have come up already today? 
Um, you know, there's been quite a bit of thinking about quite a bit of concern about conflict of interest uh, of LC scholars taking uh, funding from the private sector or even, you know, consulting, et cetera. I think it's something that we need to think really hard about. I'd love to hear more from, um, I don't know if Allison um, is here today, but yesterday she spoke to her long experience interacting with um, uh, with pharma companies um, as a consultant. And I think it's something that we really need to think and talk about how, how that can, I mean, yes, there has been already some discussion, but ongoing um, thinking about how we as a field can fight the um, decreases in federal funding, but also think about how we can strategically interact with the private sector, potentially even in some cases, I would say through research funding um, as, as sticky as that that might make make might be. So we need to think through about through that, I think. Um, on the um, content, so I, I was talking you know here a bit about the structures uh, um, of LC in the future. I, I uh, figured I'd focus mainly on that because I think Matt and uh, Larry are going to speak a little bit more to the content questions, but I just wanted to flag a couple of quick little ones because of, I, of course the financial issues are not just structural ones, they're also content issues, um, and of course are the ones I uh, I flagged because that's what I study. <laughs> um, but I did want to say, you know, the um, uh, these financial and private sector issues, there's been, a, a, you know, um, several scholars in the LC world have called attention to the fact that uh, we have not, there's not been um, as much research on these, co on corporate entities and especially, uh, and commercial entities, especially directly engaging. Uh, that's uh, the exception. We have some folks here on, and I'm glad that to see that, but I, I do think that this is something that hopefully we will see more and more LC research that engages directly with the private sector um, uh, actors, interviews, et cetera, directly, because it is a different, um, that's something that we don't see very often. And one thing I wanted to flag is that we have this, um, sort of the bigger co context of social concern around um, big tech that ties in in, an in in interesting ways and important ways with genomics. So for example, um, this is a, 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 a New York Times article from February and some some pieces that I, um, excerpts that I, that I pulled out were uh, highlighting how the Illumina case, so Illumina um, uh, uh, spun out a company called Grail, and now they're trying to reacquire them, and it's been put all, up all sorts of antitrust flags, and it's being used as this test case for understanding how the U.S. government is going to approach antitrust. Um, that is really significant, and uh, for for and very much framed in the language of the concern around what is um, what is the power uh, and what are what are the powers of, of big tech. So. Um, I, I think in the interest of time, I, I was also going to flag, well, I say, say really quickly, I flagged uh, Sarah Richardson's cryptic causality because I think she, she's, got, it's a, it's a less so the, 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 the fanciness of the term and more so the idea that uh, we're moving, we've moved into a phase of biomedical research where claims are being made based on um, uh, smaller and smaller effects. Yes, this is something that's been discussed, but um, Sarah's argument that that um, that this is a space where that makes things especially ripe for um, the way that uh, social norms make their way into science when we're ready to make claims about uh, on on very different kinds of evidence than than in the past where we have like with poly, as we've been talking about with polygenic risk scores etc very very, very small effects um, that were ready to open up this space for, for especially strong late for, um, for the influence of social norms. And it's something that I think that we'll be thinking about in LC as we move forward. So um, with that, uh, I will, that whirlwind, I will turn it over. I think Matt was gonna go next, but let me know. Yes, great. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Um, let me share my screen. Hopefully, this will work. Is that working? Uh, oh, actually, hold on. Sorry. Uh, again, with the up and coming generation and our lack of tech savvy. Uh, Okay, 
uh, is that visible and normal looking? Yeah, somewhat? perfect. Perfect. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so um, as Ruth mentioned, uh, my name is Matt Lebowitz, and I'm a psychologist. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at Columbia. Um, and uh, as you've heard for this session, we were tasked with giving our perspectives about the future of LC research. Um, that seems like a tall order. I, I often feel like I barely have a grasp on the, the you know, the past and present of LC, um, and I don't have a crystal ball to uh, predict the future. But one approach I thought of for how to you know think about this question of the future of LC is to think about this related question, which is what is the future of genetics and genomics? Um, that's the science whose ethical, legal, and social implications we're trying to study. So um, it would make sense that uh, it would be hard to predict the future of LCU without thinking about the future of genetics and genomics. And of course, there are lots of future directions in genetics and genomics, but one that particularly interests me, uh, as, as Ruth mentioned, someone who's um, interested in how people react to genetic information, is the application of genetics and genomics uh, in service of precision medicine. Um, and I thought, a definition could be helpful here. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines precision medicine as the as medical care designed to optimize efficiency or therapeutic benefit for particular groups of patients, especially by using genetic or molecular profiling. Um, and I was really interested in this part about particular groups of patients. Um, and I wondered if we could think about how to apply that kind of an approach in, in the LC universe. Um, so in other words, uh, as the, you know, as we move forward in LC, can we apply this approach um, and think about how the impact of genetic information might be different for some quote unquote particular groups than for others? Um, you know, I think I, I came up with this term precision LC um, to, to sort of encapsulate this idea. Um, and I think research that tackles this should be part of the future of LC so that we don't fall into this trap of assuming that one size fits all. I think, you know, we really can't assume that the impact of genetic information, for example, or, or lack thereof that we observe in one group, particularly a majority or dominant group, will be the same in all groups. Um, and, I'm, and just as a caveat, you know, I'm certainly not here to claim that this is some groundbreaking idea that I'm the first person to come up with, but I think it's important, it's an important one to keep in mind as we contemplate the future of LC and hasn't always necessarily been at the forefront in LC research to date, although there are certainly notable exceptions to that. Um, so as I just said, LC researchers, I think, have sometimes recognized that genetic information might have different effects or implications in some groups versus others, but too often I think this has not been a central focus. Um, I really like this piece in Genome Medicine from, it's now about almost 10 years ago, uh, by Timothy Caulfield, a professor of health law in Canada, and some of his colleagues talking about the policy implications, or, or in some cases, the lack thereof, um, of LC research. Um, and in it, um, there's this part where they say, indeed, genetic risk information seems to have little long-term impact of any kind on perceptions of behavior, dot, dot, dot. Of course, this does not mean that there are no issues. Certain individuals or groups may be more sensitive and thus more likely to react poorly to genetic bad news, dot, dot, dot. But the data do raise questions about the magnitude of the problems. The dot, dot, dots are mine. But uh, I just think it's very interesting how sort of in between two statements about how genetic information really has no negative impacts. There's really no problem here, nothing to worry about. There's a statement sort of wedged in in between those parts saying, well, there may actually be some groups that are quote unquote more sensitive. Um, where they, there may be risk, but that's almost a, uh, inserted as an afterthought. Um, just another example, um, more recently, our, our, uh, in, in this issue, special issue of the Hastings Center report uh, about searching for the psychosocial impacts of genetic testing, um, our very own Eric Perrins and Paula Applebaum in the introduction to the special issue mentioned that none of the pieces in the special report attends to whether different demographic groups are affected differently by the receipt of genomic information. There may turn out not to be significant differences, but one can't know that from the literature surveyed here. So I think this is just another example of a case where this question of how the implications of genetic information might differ from for different groups was not able to be answered. Um, I thought I'd give a couple of quick examples from my own research looking at how certain of these quote unquote particular groups might be uniquely impacted by genetic information. 
So um, this is a quote from the Caulfield et al. piece that I mentioned earlier, where they talk about how certain individual groups may be more sensitive. Um, one question I've thought about a fair amount is whether people with depression might be such a group. So we know people with depression tend to become pre preoccupied by negative information, especially self-relevant negative information. Um, and indeed, in some of our work, we found that when people with depression are given genetic explanations for their symptoms, we actually gave them uh, um, a fake genetic test and told them there either is or is not a genetic cause for your symptoms. And when people are told there is a genetic cause, they can become less confident about their ability to use their agency to regulate their own mood. So it seems like there may be especially likely to interpret this kind of personalized genetic information in a pessimistic or deterministic way, which is not super surprising if you know anything about what depression looks like. Um, and another example, um, we've looked at Black Americans, or specifically Black Americans with obesity. Um, we know from existing work that Black, as opposed to white Americans, tend to endorse genetic attributions less strongly, to be more concerned that genetic information will be used in stigmatizing ways, and to be less enthusiastic about the potential health benefits of genetic testing. A lot of these um, attitudes make sense if you think about the history of the of how genetics and genomics, among other aspects of biomedical science, have been used to kind of reinforce racial hierarchies. Um, but there, there does seem to be this difference between racial groups in the US. Um, and indeed, in a, in a recent pilot study of white identified and black identified US adults with obesity, we asked participants to read a description of a physician who believed that obesity is primarily caused by either people's genes, we call that the genetic condition, or they read a description of, a, of the same doctor, but they were told that this doctor thinks that uh, obesity is primarily caused by people's social, financial, and physical environments, as well as their life experiences. So those were the people in the non-genetic condition. And what we found was that in the non-genetic condition, um, compared to the non-genetic condition, Black participants in the genetic condition reported that they would be less interested in having the physician described as their own doctor, and white participants did not show this difference. Um, so that's kind of presented in a little bit, maybe of a convoluted way, but basically the idea is that um, the genetically oriented condition, the genetically oriented physician was seen as less appealing than the non-genetically oriented physician by Black participants, but that wasn't true for white participants. So there seems to be a difference here in how they responded to the kind of notion of geneticization of obesity in healthcare. So I thought I'd end with some broad sort of general questions for future research related to what I've been talking about. Um, so we can go beyond just depression that I mentioned and think about how might the social psychosocial impact of genetic information be different for people with other psychiatric symptoms like health anxiety, which you could imagine would be very uh, impactful in terms of people's interest in uh, genetic testing results, for example, um, or family histories of mental disorders, other things too, of course. Um, similarly, um, we, we can think about how Black Americans may be less enthusiastic about genetically based uh, pre precision medicine approaches to conditions like obesity. Um, but I think that's just one example. And broadly speaking, we need more research about the specific attitudes and beliefs about genetically informed healthcare and other demographic groups that um, show health disparities like other racial and ethnic minorities as well, LGBTQ individuals, et cetera. And of course, there's already lots of fascinating work going on related to many of these issues. Um, and I hope that the LC of the future will treat this kind of scholarship as a centerpiece of, of our field and not as an afterthought. Um, I think, you know, just to conclude as LC scholars, I, I think it's really important to keep in mind that we can't generalize across demographic and clinical populations when making conclusions about the psychosocial impacts of genetic information. We really have to think about, uh, you know, as we approach or, or as we conceptualize the LC of the future, we need to recognize that the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics will depend on the quote unquote particular groups in which we choose to study them. Uh, so I'll end there. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Larry. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Alexis and Matt, for inviting me to uh, this conference and speaking on this panel. Um, I'm not an LC scholar, I'm a sociologist, uh, but I do try and um, keep in touch with LC scholarship and try to learn a lot from the colleagues uh, uptown. Um, so 
definitely enjoyed hearing a lot of conversations in the past two days. Um, today, today I'll be talking a little bit about um, a new phenomenon in China that sums from my dissertation research on precision medicine in China. Uh, some of you may have come across stories about the rise in uh, genetic talent testing in China used by parents to um, uh, distinguish different traits in their children that they think um, are innate areas of talent. Um, uh, this is based off a study that was recently published in a public understanding of science. Um, and um, yeah, um, this study looks at the different motivations that parents um, uh, invoke in um, taking these tests for their children. Um, as I said, a lot of my research also looks at um, different conceptions that scientists in China have towards LC and towards ethical, social, and, uh, and legal implications of their own work, but also more broadly about their own uh, um, um, ideas towards genetic reductionism and uh, biological essentialism and how these ideas travel differently in a social context in China uh, where scientists do have a higher social standing, where they also are as um, checked perhaps by critical bioethicists, uh, by other social scientists who might be able to here in the United States push back on some of the claims that um, you might also find um, problematic in the US context. Um, but yeah, I'll say a few words about data methods. We do have data method sociology. Um, a lot of um, what I'm gonna show you is from um, the gathering of documentary materials from other websites, press releases, and marketing materials from um, the 48 or so direct to consumer genetic uh, companies um, in China. About half of them offer um, variations of genetic talent testing. Um, and these are tests that are explicitly marketed as such. Um, I also drew on uh, newspaper archives of news, report, news reports in China um, and foreign news outlets um, to show how coverage of these um, uh, tests have changed over time and how experts have also uh, criticized these tests. Um, a lot of these experts, as you'll see, also come from precision medicine, from uh, genomics and genetics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how they portray these tests. Um, but the bulk of my data, I'm looking at parental attitudes, um, stems from social media data. Um, a lot of them are from a website called Juhu, which is very similar to uh, the website Quora here in the United States. Um, these are typically quite lengthy posts. Um, the population of Juhu users are typically a little bit more educated. Folks who are plugged into um, debates and current affairs um, in um, scientific debates. Um, so yeah, that's an idea of what the data looks like. Um, so yeah, a lot of these tests um, you'll find um, saw an idea of precision education. Um, the text on the right from a company called Roman Genetics um, asked, have you seen your child uh, cry a lot? Have you seen them um, grind their teeth a lot? An indication for them of emotional intelligence. Um, Add to the left says that um, in order to understand the individual characteristics of children, um, use our genetic testing and that will quickly lead to a successful life. Um, there's an ad on the bottom left from another company called Cloud Gene. And it's asking um, the parents, um, are you still letting your child finally take classes in maths, in dancing, um, in music, um, learn to scientifically manage your children and to manage yourself um, in raising your child? So a lot of these companies are drawing on popular conceptions of uh, multiple intelligences um, and invoking these somewhat scientific but somewhat pseudoscientific ideas about scientifically raising their children. Uh, for those of you who've done 23 me testing, you'll recognize these kind of dashboards. Uh, this is again from a company called Cloud Gene. Um, this is um, a, a report showing the uh, musical abilities of uh, the children um, that were tested. Uh, for this child that has a middling ability in music and talent, they recommend uh, three to four hours of instruction a week. Um, so yeah, these tests have also gathered um, in more recent years um, attention from scientific elites worried about how um, the proliferation of these uh, recreational tests potentially might have blowbacks and effects on their broader scientific projects. Um, so this is a quote from uh, Zeng Changqing, who is the uh, chief scientist uh, for the Precision Medicine Project at the China Academy of Sciences, the nation's top scientific institute. Um, and, asks, and, it, and she says, talent genetics deals with phenotypes that are particularly complex, even for your height. There are many genes that help shape the outcome we know that some genes contribute to how tall you become, but this does also only contribute to a fraction of what your height will be. This is measured in millimeters. So using only a few genes to calculate whether your child can grow up to be like Yao Ming, I think our science is not yet matured. Um, the reporter goes on in the same segment to talk about how um, um, these tests are basically digital fortune telling. Uh, we still don't have this type of big data related to talent genetics. 
Uh, but overall, um, a lot of these uh, criticisms from experts in genomics and genetics um, are a little bit more measured. Um, they're still trying to um, sell the idea that someday perhaps the science can catch up to the technology that these emerging, emerging technologies potentially someday might have applications in education and that it's been silence. Um, so yeah, I also did a constant analysis of uh, forum posts uh, from parents. Um, and for the most part, uh, posts also echoed what the experts um, in uh, media in China um, featured. They're mostly skeptical um, of uh, genetic silent testing. Again, um, this is a forum where uh, the typical profile of users are typically a little bit more educated or a little bit more plugged into these scientific debates. Um, so this is a quote from a post from a parent on this forum. Um, I can't say that there's no scientific basis to talent testing. I can only say that they have a small scientific basis. For example, many people have used associational analysis to find some genes related to musical talents, such as in the article, the genetic basis of musical ability and the theories of psychology. A lot of other people have also found genes related to athletic ability. The so-called talent tests use these genes. Um, so yeah, perhaps you have an idea of how these different scientific findings travel to different contexts are not taken up by different members of the public. Um, but yeah, a lot of um, the ideas about precision education can also be seen in this quote from another parent on this forum. Um, Lei Jun, the founder of Xiaomi, a tech company in China, was a high school student. He finished his university program in just two years. He became an engineer, now has a good life. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, grew up naughty and always got into fights. In his uh, first Gao Kao exam, China's uh, university exams, he scored zero in mathematics. On his second try, he scored 19 points. But now Jack Ma is a leader of China's economy. When parents want to pursue a legion uh, like child, the problem is that when they have a naughty Jack Ma like child, they can only sigh and desperately chase after a legion of a Jack Ma like whip, forcing them to study subjects like maths where they cannot succeed. This will only lead to failure and genetic talent testing. Look at these children's in the multiple dimensions. Um, on these forums, you also find some indications of worries about um, Gattaca like features uh, for children in China. Um, this parent um, talks about how um, if your child says, I don't like music, I want to learn to paint, are you supposed to then say, according to science, you aren't suitable for painting? Your genes tell me that you have an 80% chance of achieving success in music. Can children grow up happily in the future? the child will no longer have a choice, less to betray their genetics. I believe that investing in these kinds of genetic testing can be stopped. Chinese parents are eager to succeed and the students are fiercely competitive. Um, so yeah, just summing up uh, from this case, uh, what um, some lessons for the future of LC uh, for policymakers, um, perhaps it's a bit hard to distinguish between uh, recreational and health genetics. Uh, we talked a little bit about the blurry boundaries of research and clinical genetics, but um, this is also something that um, uh, pertains for recreational uses of genetics here. Uh, for scientists, um, there probably is also a responsibility towards paying attention to supposed off-label uses of their knowledge. Um, and a lot of the previous speakers have talked about the potentials and dangers of um, using uh, polygenic risk scores for embryo selections, dangers of germline gene editing. Um, and yeah, for LC scholars, recognize that there are different cultural and social contexts in which genetic knowledge is mobilized. Um, in this case, in the context of high tech testing, uh, competitive university um, admissions, and in the case where scientists um, can make claims and are less checked by their LC colleagues. Um, so I will leave it here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, So, Matt, you, you have some comments? You have your hand up, or you're applauding. Oh, yeah, no, that, that, that was just me applauding. You're applauding. OK. We didn't do enough applauding in this whole session, I think. Matt was applauding himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, <laughs> I'm teasing, of course. Anyway, I, but I think actually really quickly, I mean, I think we're going to have some questions. But you know, the fact that, Larry, you say you're not an Elsie's scholar to me is is very telling of I'm like that's my point <laughs> you yeah, to me you are clearly you're a sociologist that studies precision medicine and studies genetic testing companies um so anyway it's not part of your identity um but I think that um I would hope that sociologists who study such things would consider themselves as I think it would be really significant for the for Elsie that to have that engagement 
Yeah, I had the same thought, and I and it, and Lexus, it did make me think of your what you were saying in your talk about um, sort of structural issues in the field, and you know we're all from different scholarly backgrounds, and uh, I know what when you know I was in graduate school and psychology no one said to me oh you should think about the you should look at the lc program well actually someone eventually did say that to me but uh and i'm lucky that they did uh, it was actually joe phelan came in as a guest speaker um in a seminar series in my department and that's how i even heard about the lc program or the learned even oh, about the existence of the abbreviation lc <clears throat> um because you were definitely doing it yeah, I think I was, and I just didn't even know that that existed as a field. Um, and I think that that is a structural issue that we have these sort of dual professional identities um, where when you're thinking of the future of a field, that, um, you know, people, they, Alexis mentioned like, if, can we even call it a field? And I think that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, it's, it's a funding source and it's a, but, but it and it's a it's like sort of a loose grouping of, in, of intellectual interests. But um, I think that certainly has implications for the future of the discipline, um, whether people really identify included incorporated as part of their identities. So uh, Anna has a comment, but before I call on her, I just wanted to ask you whether whether there are challenges to finding mentorship because because of. Well, for one thing, because the SEER program is not going to be ongoing and and another because you are in kind of this world that's so in between. I, um, I can say a few quick words on that too. Um, so this is on my acknowledgement slides, but I think I skipped over um, a, a lot of I think um, my exposure towards LC comes from um, Columbia's Precision Medicine and Society program that uh, Paul um, and my advisor Gil Yao directs. So, yeah. I think a lot of, yeah, um, the education and training that I was exposed to um, towards issues of science and medicine, um, these are things that don't quite come naturally to folks who self-select perhaps in pseudo-social sciences and sociology. Mm. Um, I think if you would ask a lot of folks who are also doing medical sociology or sociology of health and illness, they might not necessarily identify as LC scholars as well. Um, I was talking to a colleague about uh, recommendations about papers to read about um, precision medicine in a uh, chronic uh, illnesses and I think their instinct was to, yeah, go to these journals um, um, in sociology and journal health and social health and behavior or um, social science medicine. Uh, they might not go into um, things like uh, genetic medicine or the more like hard sciences journals. Uh, so definitely is a divide in, in terms of the training and in terms of how the structural issues in terms of how we publish and what we read. Yeah, I think there's, uh, it's, it's a little bit my, my hobby horse to talk about how uh, bioethics and LC study such similar issues as the critical social sciences that study the science and study medicine. And yet we don't talk to each other. Of course, again, I keep giving this caveat, not unique to LC, but still important to us, I think, um, to be thinking about how, um, you know, how we interface. I mean, I think there is still quite a bit of feeling within um, what I'm using short term hand for critical social sciences and humanities. Uh, there's quite a uh, quite a skeptical view of bioethics and LC. There's been quite a lot of critique and you know written published criticism of claiming that LC is too close to the um, uh, to its objects of study, which is interesting. When I talked a little bit about being you know potentially the question of funding from private sources, and people are very concerned about that. But we are funded by NHGRI, who are the people who, you know, are essentially the people we're supposed to be studying. So, you know, it's an interesting thing in terms of anyway. So I think there's some some of the social science critiques are are really unfair. They're I think founded in a um, in a um, vis vision of what LC and bioethics are that is are not quite fair. Um, so anyway, there I guess there's a little bit of reputational uh, uh, interaction that needs to happen. That's somewhat on the STS folks side, but I will say one of the first year meetings I went to, um, a SEER scholar said to my STS colleague, oh yeah, you guys, you guys don't like us. <laughs> and and um, you know, it does, it, there's, there's some tension and that I, I, I'm, but I, that's why I started my comments by saying I'm, I've been very heartened to see, I do think that there's a lot of interest in the 
um, in the humanities and in the qualitative social sciences in, in, in the LC world. I also didn't consider myself an LC scholar as a grad student. I didn't study, I didn't study genomics, so that I wouldn't have been, but, um, in any case, I do think, you know, a lot of things in, in life and in academia happen fortuitously, but we can still, I think, guide paths to make that more and more common. Anna? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all of your the panelists' thoughts. I'm wondering if you think that there should be any core training for somebody who aspires to the LC researcher label. And um, with the sunsetting of the SEER programs, um, should we, the junior people, the more junior people, I'm more junior than the three of you, um, be thinking of you know, what, what should we be planning to make sure that any training um, is in place? It's a good question. If you think training is needed, which you might not. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I personally think that, um, One of the one of the sort of advantages of LC as an interdisciplinary field is that people have all different training backgrounds, um, and I think having strong training in methods of your own discipline is is it's going to be we're never going to get away from that being the core thing that um, you know allows people to have something to bring to the table because uh, you. LC can mean a lot of different things, and I don't think there's ever going to be a training that can make you uh, competent practicing scholar in every LC in every discipline that is relevant to LC. Uh, so I think, I mean, having a strong, um, you know, training background in your own discipline, and then as you move for as you move along and and sort of move into the LC space, you know, picking up what you can about other related disciplines. That's at least been my approach. And I think that seems to be most people's approaches. Um, and it seems like that's probably the best we can do, but I, I don't know, others may disagree. Maybe that's just a status quo bias, but. Um, well, I will, I will say that one of the best parts of our SEER has been having fellows that we could train and, you know, we had, we've had a wonderful set of fellows and Matt was one of them. Yes, uh, which I realized I failed to mention in my, when I was introducing myself, but yes, I was a, a postdoc in this, in the Columbia year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been a great experience. And I think a really good part of the SEER program is having that training as part of it. But now, you know, NHGRI, although it's sunsetting the Sears, it's still funding T32 grants, which are devoted to training uh, of LC scholars. And I think you're right though, Matt, you know, all, all of the people that we've trained have, you know, had a background in a particular discipline, medical sociology or uh, law and bioethics in the case of um, Maya, um, we had another trainee in law. We had someone in anthropology. Is Anna here? Anna Yablona? Yeah, I think she is. She was uh, earlier. Yeah, Anna? she's Anna. Oh, there you are, Anna. <laughs> Hello. Psychology. <laughs> and of course, yeah. psychology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm with Matt for sure. And with what you echoed that I do think that the, um, a lot of the a lot of the um, wealth of our of our arena <laughs> um, comes from all of these uh, people who are trained deeply in many different fields, and I think um, I would I would hate to see that go away. I think that what Ruth pointed out is that the training often happens at the postdoctoral level, which I, mm -hmm. you know, I think personally works pretty well. Although it does, I think it. Uh, I, will, I think it makes some challenges for careers. I mean, it is hard to 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 navigate the worlds, and that's okay. But it but it if we can do more to help people, I think that that's fair. I will say I also um, am going to try to plug in my department, but um, I, I'll plug it here. I do think if 
we offered some, if LC programs would offer some grant writing training workshops for, you know, or boot camps for, I don't love that term, but for grad students that could take, I think that even if it wasn't necessarily too LC focused and, uh, you know, Ruth, you uh, offered, been um, offered some um, methodological um, coursework, but I think even longer term on, on grant writing would be really helpful because, I mean, my, I was trained in a, department where all of the professors are hard money funded. I didn't really even know what hard versus soft money was when I finished my PhD. And I do think that's one of the big divides, right? Is that the LC world is a generally grant funded world. And so, um, but nonetheless, all fields, you need to know how to write grants. And my, you know, our, our graduate student association uh, went to I, 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 I was the president when I was a grad student and we went to the faculty and said, you know, we'd love to have some training in grant writing and that we were sort of told, ah, that's not really the heart of scholarship. And, and um, so I think if we had had access to, a, you know, a week long intensive for that was on grant writing, uh, I think people would have taken advantage and I think it's a way to potentially attract people into the, to know what LC is, even if, you know, if you say, okay, this is a sort of boot camp in grant writing for you know, I don't know how it would be framed exactly, but then, you know, it would be a way to welcome people into the field. Larry, I have a, a question about your, about a, a substantive question. It's so interesting to hear the Chinese perspective. I don't understand how economics works there. I mean, these these are companies, right? Or how, yeah. how does that work? Are they government supported or are they the actual independent companies? These are for the most part uh, independent companies um, spun off um, in science parts um, by a lot of university scientists as well too. There's a lot of stakes. Um, one of the things that always surprises me when I go do field work in China, when I do interviews of um, sciences there is running into um, someone's PhD advisor here in the US um, at, at the company in China. All the folks um, on the scientific advisory boards are scientists here in the US, um, oh. at least before 2020 when things started to uh, crack down a little bit uh, with more scrutiny over uh, US-China ties and the life sciences. Um, yeah, a lot of these are independent companies. Um, and there's yeah. about 200 biotech companies in China and um, there's about 40 or so um, direct to consumer genetic testing companies in China right now. I see. And, and I, I didn't, I wasn't able to get a take home message. Are people responding positively to this kind of precision education? Or, you know, what would you say is a summary of their reactions to it? Um, there are perhaps a large segment of users who are discontent with uh, the social pressures of the Chinese educational system. So they are turning to um, some of these technologies as a way to uh, yeah, be able to push back on traditional subjects like uh, maths um, and um, language. Um, so they're able to um, 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 yeah, use these types of knowledge to identify areas of talent for their children. So it's um, an area that is um, growing, but yeah, one of them take a message is that the scientists in China, while they're trying to push back on these practices, on these um, use of these emerging technologies, uh, they're not entirely successful, partly because they're also wedded to uh, the idea of the power of genetics. Um, and um, yeah. yeah. One of the things that I- Personally, it's scary to me. I mean, you know, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, um, may have been evident from the panel, but we I don't think we said explicitly is that uh, um, when we were thinking about the design of this panel, um, having uh, Larry who who is speaking to um, issues in China internationally, it, that for the future of LC is really important. I mean, when we think, yes, we have some, yeah, yeah, I mean, not to say we don't do international, LC isn't international at all, but will be, I think, increasingly so, um, and especially scholars like Larry who can um, do analysis um, it, uh, in, uh, in other languages, et cetera, is really important. And yeah, there's a somewhat like international divisional labor too. I think um, a lot of scientists I talk to in China, they get their LC training here when it comes to the US um, to conferences and they attend the one LC panel, in their uh, um, human genetics conference that they go to here in the US. Um, and that's, yeah, again, something that might be interrupted with the um, US-China uncoupling. Um, so there is something to 
think about in terms of how you reach out to scientists overseas, how are you able to package contents, package messages for them to be able to digest and be able to deploy in your own social context. Um, so if each, each of you was going to make a, a statement now about what you think the highest priorities are for LC research in the future, what would you, what would you say? Well, I, I would just echo, I guess, what I said in my presentation, which is that I think it's, um, I don't know if it's the most important thing, but one of one important uh, direction will, I think will be to, um, I guess, move away from sort of broad based kinds of attempts to generalize across uh, everyone in, in making in drawing conclusions about the impact or implications of genetic advances and genetic information. Um, and to int introduce more precision, for lack of a better term, into that uh, th yeah. those um, analyses, or even the research questions themselves. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about uh, defining groups in this conference, and this is another application of that same concept. People differ in different ways. Alexis? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with my sort of take home from my little uh, 10 minute chat as well, which is that I mean, that was, there were many things I was trying to comment on. But um, I do think that as we move forward, there's a lot of, you know, I think there's a lot of concern about what's happening in DTC genomics, we hear about it a lot. But I think that our methods for um, analyzing sort of the, the 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 details and the nuances of those companies are, are I, I really hope we can develop those further because for now you know there we often do a sort of analysis of the, their web materials and maybe we can do look at their SEC filings or otherwise but I don't think that many people are doing that um, and I, I hope we can work on towards being able to dig be dig into uh, sort of the ethics of companies, which are it, are a challenge because we, we're going to do it through interviews. But of course, I mean those always um, pose their own problems about what the relationship of the interviewer in an interviewee is and the motives behind mm -hmm. what people say, which are true for not just in this sector, true many places, yeah. but uh, do yeah. raise you know raise issues. So how do we get, how do we really dig into what the sort of nuances of those issues are. I think that I'm hoping we can have some, I can have some teammates help me <laughs> uh, work towards that. Um, yeah, just echoing what Alexa said in terms of um, looking for um, uses of genetic knowledge, information in non-traditional health contexts, non-medical contexts, uh, whether it's in schools, universities, uh, in um, parenting um, clubs, parenting blogs online. Um, so these are things that um, have real world effects that I think um, LC scholars, sociologists have to grapple with down the road. Terrific. But it is really lovely to be a part of a, an arena that does put so much attention on, on junior scholars. I think that's really fabulous. I see it in this conference and I see it generally throughout the LSA world and it's, I think it's, uh, it's meaningful to me. So thank you. Welcome. Uh, oh, Paul, I'm glad you, I was hoping you would say something now. Yeah, so um, I want to thank all of our uh, um, long-term uh, attendees, uh, those of you who are still here, and, and many of you have been here for the entire uh, conference. This is a particularly meaningful event for us, given that it marks the culmination of, of our 12 years as a center. and. Um, uh, frankly, I, I'm not sure we could have done it in a in a better way than to have uh, the terrific presentations uh, that we've heard over the last two days. So I, I very much want to thank all our speakers as well um, for the effort they put into their presentations and and to be with us. Many of them were here for uh, throughout the the conference or for much of the conference, well beyond their own talks. So. Um, Thank you all. Thanks to Ruth, who did an enormous amount of work uh, putting this together and, and a great Not job alone. moderating it. Um, so um, we wish everybody a good weekend. We're not disappearing. We'll, we'll
will still be um, here in the LC world in a somewhat different uh, guise and, and structure, but um, your being here with us for this was, uh, was very much appreciated.